The use of watches in movies is extremely interesting because it goes beyond just the idea of a prop in a film. They're objects that have great meaning to people, both in real life and on the screen. I think when you put a watch into a film, you're translating that meaning into the film itself. It could represent them wearing something that their father or their mother wore. And that's important to the character development. It can also show the connection between two characters, while at the same time serving as a functional tool. And I think watches really are the things you see on a character's wrist most in a the film. Their outfits change, the costumes change, but the watches, they're there the entire time. Hi, I am Danny Milton. I am a senior editor at Hodinkee. I write about watches, I write about movies, and I write about the intersection of watches and movies. And today, we're going to be watching movies. I think today I'm gonna to show you some movies that have some seriously cool watches in them. These are movies I've written about on Hodinkee and movies I'm really passionate about. If you know nothing about watches at all, but you just love movies, you might just appreciate watches a lot more today. And if you're coming in as a watch lover, I think you're gonna see a lot of these movies in a new light. It's my nest egg, Jack. At my age, you gotta think ahead. When I find you. Pop quiz, hot shot. There's a bomb on a bus. All right, some 90s Keanu Reeves. Who doesn't love speed? I love speed. It blows up. What do you do? What do you do? What we have here is the movie Speed, obviously. And this is one of the most classic, if not the most classic, watch zoom-in shots ever put to film. I want my money by 11 a.m. We can't pull that kind of money in time. I couldn't be more 90s and I couldn't love it anymore. And what we're seeing is a classic G-Shock DW5600. G-Shock is one of those watches that can basically do anything. In this scene, Keanu Reeves' character is hearing from Dennis Hopper's character, the basic plot convention of the film. There's a bomb on a bus. Bus can't go below 50 miles per hour or it will explode. He wants money and he's telling him when he wants his money. So we're looking at our watch, we're zooming in on our watch, and we're seeing our G-Shock. The same way this movie has very simple plot conventions, this watch does exactly what you need it to do, and it serves that function perfectly in the film. All you need is a watch that you can look down and measure the time as you need to. I mean, that is what the whole point of the film is for, and there's nothing easier than a digital watch, like a Casio G-Shock, to do that. This is not just a great entry point into watches, but I can tell you that super collectors of high-end watches also have these in their collections and treat them as well as any watch they own and wear them just as much as any watch they own. It can do a whole lot more than watches that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. It has basically every function you can think of inside of a watch. I think it was the perfect watch for Keanu's character in Speed. There are rules, Jack. Okay, we have the oxygen system checked. We have the yellow restraint ring checked. Check out Apollo 13 is one of those films where we're looking at historical accuracy and watches. The director, the prop master, they have to make this choice. It's the correct choice. It's the only choice. The Omega Speedmaster was used by the astronauts on Apollo 13 as a chronograph. They used that function to time engine burns to resituate their spacecraft to successfully re-enter the Earth safely. And that is an amazing story, an amazing feat, and something that only could have been done when all other technology failed in the spacecraft. The watch, the mechanical watch, was still there, and it was able to help bring them home. This is a killer film because it really like captures the era. There's a scene where Jim Lovell's daughter is upset that the Beatles broke up. So you know that, that they're nailing the time that it's taking place in and that stretches all the way to the watches on their wrist. Now this watch that I'm holding in my hand is the most modern iteration of the Omega Speedmaster, but it features a type of bracelet that you'll actually see in this film. When you see Hanks as Jim Lovell wearing the watch in civilian life at home, you'll see him wearing it on this kind of bracelet. And this is an iconic watch, much like the Rolex Submariner, because it really hasn't changed. It has a, a very sparse black dial with white hands and white markers, which make it super legible and easy to see in situations like needing to use it in deep space, where it's, it's pretty dark. When it comes to movie lovers, this watch is just as interesting because it's a narrative object. It pushes the story forward. There would be no re-entry into Earth without the watch. For those who don't know the Speedmaster but love this film, you'll not only see this watch on the wrist of Tom Hanks 
playing Tom Hanks as Jim Lovell, but you'll see it on the wrists of all the astronauts in the film. And that is just how historical accuracy in filmmaking is illustrated through a watch. And to me, that is just the coolest thing in the world. Okay, yeah, that hurts. Sounds like you're in a rugby scrum. I just show someone your watch. Really blew their mind. Uh, we've got the No Time to Die Seamaster here. It's a titanium version of a, a very popular Omega Seamaster Professional 300M. The James Bond series, all the Bond films, have a seriously long and very storied history with the watches that James Bond wears on screen. This started with Sean Connery way back in the 1960s where he wore a Rolex Submariner. The watches have been cool because they're part of like the James Bond gadget lore. They always do something fun. And in No Time to Die, it's, it's really no different. This is a watch that was designed for the film. And there's a history of this with James Bond films that dates back to the Pierce Brosnan GoldenEye, where he wore a blue Omega Seamaster Professional 300M, which has since been renamed as the Bond Seamaster. Omega has really taken the James Bond thing very seriously, and they create a lot of special edition 007 watches. But this one for me is the most compelling co-branded James Bond Omega release. Daniel Craig, as a lover of watches, helped to design this watch and see it through to completion. And it has a very kind of vintage aesthetic to it. The British government property broad arrow symbols on the dial to show his service in MI6. Kind of like the Rolex Submariner, you have the dive bezel. It's very legible. You actually have two crowns on this watch. One of them winds the watch and sets the time. This here is a helium escape valve, which allows helium to literally escape from the watch outside of the water. You'll never use this function. And it's extremely light. It's made of titanium. It has this mesh bracelet on it. And you can see him wearing it you know, throughout the film. It's given to him by Q, the quartermaster. And you see it in a really interesting scene to uh, initiate an EMP to basically blow up the, the eyeball of, of the villain in the scene. This watch, for the record, does not do that. For anybody wondering at home, it does, however, tell the time, which is equally useful. It has what watch lovers love, which is this clicky sound that the bezel makes. If you get into watches, for those that aren't yet into them, you'll be doing this all day and annoy all the friends that you have. But more importantly than that, it's just a great looking watch and it's grown to be an icon in its own right. For Bond fans out there, there's really no cooler thing getting to wear the watch that James Bond actually wears. And this is one of the coolest, most amazing, most wearable examples of a Bond Omega that they've ever done. All right, so we got a classic life aquatic scene, very typical Wes Anderson, you know, soundtrack heavy montage going on. We're watching the Zisu crew prepare for uh, their mission to go find a jaguar shark and kill it because the jaguar shark ate Steve Zisu's best friend Esteban. In this scene, we're seeing Owen Wilson wearing a Rolex GMT Master II. It's called the Pepsi GMT because it has a red and blue bezel. Thank you very much. The one I'm holding here is actually a GMT Master, but functionally and aesthetically, it's the same watch that's being worn in the Life Aquatic by Owen Wilson's character. So it's interesting that this watch is in this film because it's at once very appropriate watch and at another moment, maybe a little bit out of place. So Owen Wilson plays a character who is actually a commercial airline pilot. So him wearing a Pepsi GMT is extremely appropriate for the character. The Rolex GMT Master was developed in the 1950s as a project between Rolex and the airline Pan Am. They developed a watch for pilots who needed to tell the difference between different time zones they were traveling in. So in that sense, Owen Wilson and wearing this watch is super appropriate. In this montage, however, he's using the watch in a moment where it looks like he's prepping for a dive, but that's not necessarily that wrong. Rolex developed a case called the Oyster Case, and the crown on the watch screws in so that it is able to be water resistant even if it's not rated for diving depth. So the GMT Master is water resistant to 100 meters. So I think in this scenario, it's perfectly appropriate for him to wear the watch, though if he's gonna be going deeper than let's say 150 meters, then he would probably need a proper dive watch. 
when you think about Wes Anderson films, you think color. You know, you think about world building that is like uh, a mirror of our own universe, but just tweaked in a very Wes Anderson sort of way. And the GMT Master is historically one of the most fun. And I think that's the one that fits best in a Wes Anderson universe. And the watch has meaning, which for me, from a filmmaking perspective, is a lot more compelling. All I'm seeing is Redford and a boat, and water, and that's how I know it's all is lost. Okay, so we've got All Is Lost, a modern Robert Redford movie. He's sort of the icon of the 1970s, but he had a resurgence of late before finally retiring from acting and did this movie where basically it's a one-man film about a man stranded at sea and he's got to figure out how to survive. Now the scene we just saw from the beginning of the film, we're watching Redford being awakened from his sleep because his boat has sprung an insanely large leak. And throughout the movie, he has a watch on his wrist, which is super visible and it is not very expensive, but has become extremely recognizable. It's from the brand Seiko, and this is the SKX009. Doesn't have like an actual name to it. Most Seikos are just known by their reference number. Like the Rolex GMT is known as a Pepsi bezel, but instead of being a GMT bezel, this is actually a diving bezel. The red section is for decompression timing and the blue for the duration. So the blue and the red, Pepsi. What I like about the watch in this film is something that I noticed in a lot of Robert Redford films. One of my favorite films of all time is All the President's Men. He wears his own personal Rolex Submariner in that film. Another really classic is Three Days of the Condor. He wears another dive watch called a Doxa Shark Hunter. It just shows this progression of Redford as a watch guy in films. Redford strikes me as the kind of person that likes to wear tool watches that are fairly inexpensive and super durable. And I don't know if this was his personal piece, but I'd like to imagine that it was. One for you, one for me. When I'm up there in Hypersea. Or... Christopher Nolan's Interstellar, I think it's indisputably now a classic film, a modern classic film. And there's one watch brand, which has become kind of known as the watch brand of movies, is Hamilton. And so what we have in this movie is a Hamilton khaki pilot day date. There's actually two watches in this film, but the one that I have is the one worn by Matthew McConaughey, his character Cooper in the film. It's a pretty emotional scene, but it's a scene where he's telling his daughter Murph that he needs to go on this mission to find new livable planets for the people of Earth to travel to, to survive. He's wearing this watch on his wrist and he pulls another watch out of the pocket of his jacket and he holds it in his hand. And he's explaining to her that where he's going in space, the time might move more slowly for him. Now there's really something interesting about this movie when it comes to watches. When I saw it for the first time, I was really drawn to this watch on Matthew McConaughey's wrist because he wears it on Earth and in space. It's clearly important to him, but he has this other watch. And that other watch was a watch made by Hamilton specifically for this film. It became known as the Murph, co-designed by Christopher Nolan, the director, by the prop master, Richie Kramer, uh, and Hamilton. And the Murph watch ends up playing a really important narrative role in the film. Spoiler alert for anyone that hasn't seen Interstellar. Late in the movie, Matthew McConaughey sort of comes back as a quote unquote ghost because he finds himself lost inside of a black hole and he's seeing time differently. And he's able to program Morse code into the watch so that his daughter Murph can see the seconds hand sort of pinging in Morse code, giving her a message. I mean, it's obviously super outlandish, probably impossible, doesn't make any sense. You know, you have to suspend huge disbelief to get to that point, but that's all watches. And that's really cool. But obviously what I'm holding here is a very kind of classic aviator's watch. That's the style of the watch from the way the numerals look. A pilot's watch should always be very big so that when you're in a cockpit and you're looking down at your wrist, you can really see it at a quick glance. The inclusion of watches in this movie that separates it from so many other movies that have watches in them is the way that the watches are expressed both thematically and narratively. How these two watches are gonna end up playing very different roles for the characters. I mean, look at one of the watches that Coop is about to take with him to space. It will seem like time is passing the same for him, but for his daughter Murph with her watch on another planet in another galaxy, it's a whole other thing. But even taking it and shrinking it down to a more human level, you're watching a father pass a watch down to his daughter. 
And he's not sure if he'll ever come back again. So that watch for her is gonna hold the memory of her father forever. And watches, and why I love them just even more than them being in films, is they are heirlooms and they're keepers of memories. And you're watching that happen in real time in this film and it's capturing the essence of watches in a really, really emotional and impactful way. I love them all. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Merry what? Christmas. And? So Goodfellas, Martin Scorsese, probably a movie I've seen a hundred times. It tells the story of Henry Hill, eventual government informant who used to be a member of the mob. In this scene, we are watching him on Christmas with his family where he buys the most expensive fake Christmas tree there is. What's really neat from a watch perspective is he's wearing possibly the most aspirational iconic watch there is, the gold Rolex Day-Date, also known as the Rolex President. This is a watch that has been worn by many US presidents, but it's kind of that watch you think of. When I retire and I get that gold watch, it's the Rolex Day-Date, the Rolex President. It's a watch you see in some films like Glen Gary, Glen Ross, Alec Baldwin famously wears one. But in Goodfellas, it's interesting because this watch is featured for a very short period of time. Goodfellas kind of spans many years of Henry Hill's life. In this period of his life, when he seems to be doing the best right before the proverbial stuff hits the fan, he has what I think is his most expensive watch that he, he owns throughout the film. It shows his success, shows his station in life, and that's what a Rolex, a gold Rolex, should do. Now, what makes the Rolex Day-Date so special? Well, it only comes in precious metals, which means it only comes in gold or platinum. And it's super useful because as the name suggests, it shows you the day and the date and the time. It comes on this very iconic bracelet, which has become known as the President Bracelet. It measures about 36 millimeters. It's heavy because it's a precious metal and it just looks amazing. Of course, it's super expensive, but why do I love it in this movie? Because there's a certain ostentatiousness to it that only this watch could show without having to tell. You see him wearing it, and you kind of know where he's at in life. And I love that. I also happen to love this watch a lot. I aspire to own this watch one day, but it's great to see it in Goodfellas. Cool. I kind of, I kind of did it. Yeah. You can't. You want to like, you know, do a little Ray Liotta bit? Karen! I got the most expensive watch they had. Yeah, that's kind of what the Rolex Day Date is. No, no. <laughs>